Va bene. Come on. Show me pretty bird. Love the way it's trained. Yeah. Pretty Show me pretty bird. Come on. How do you train a, the bird to do that? Lots of time, lots of patience. She'll do pretty much whatever you want her to do. She'll, you know, she'll come up to full wings and of course from there she'll turn somersaults. Oh. Um, she's just a baby at heart. <laughs> you can do anything you want with her. How she's old is very she? Gentle. She's 32 years old. 32? Boy, that's almost as old as me. <laughs> yes, Fred. <laughs> she'll stand on her head if I can get my hands around here to, to get her held properly. Oh. She, uh, she has complete trust in us and uh, of course, she knows we're not going to drop her. And would you like to try and hold her? Well, sure. Oops. <laughs> they do all kinds of strange things. Okay. Ah! Ooh! Boy! Those toenails are sharp. They do have sharp toenails, but of course, that is their method of, of eating and holding mm -hmm. their food and climbing. Huh. And so they have to be sharp. What, what kind of bird is this? A, a parrot. It's a bird. scarlet macaw. Scarlet macaw. Get your wings up there. Well, I imagine, uh, yeah, well, this is Rich McIntyre, by the way, who's the owner of Friend or Pet Store here in Lansing. A lot of, a lot of you might want to get a, a wildlife pet for somebody for mm -hmm. Christmas. That's why I have Glenn Dutterer here, Extension Wildlife Man. We're going to talk about this, along with a lot of Christmas gift ideas for sportsmen. In just a moment, stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. I think Polly's tired. <laughs> oh, Polly's tired. rock by Polly. Ooh, those are sharp claws. Does she ever bite... Did she ever bite in her 32 years of training? Oh, absolutely. She uh, practically crushed the bone in uh, in my thumb. Is that right? When I sure, when I first come to work here, uh, before I bought the place, she got me across the thumb and uh, she crushed the the top and the bottom of the bone. She oh. she can break a Brazil nut with that beak. That beak. Well, Glenn, I imagine you have a lot of people call you at the extension office here at Michigan State and want to know about keeping wildlife for pets. Yes, what a number of calls. With? There's some problems with that. Certainly, most wild animals require very specialized care, and uh, they can create a lot of problems, uh, dangers to themselves and to their owners, and then usually there's a problem of, well, what do we do with mm -hmm. them, especially when they become sexually mature. What, what about the law, though? Let's talk about the law. Can you go out, you can go out and get earthworms, night crawlers. Yes, you can. I mean, you All can right. uh, go out and get salamanders? Yes. Frogs? Yes. Toads? And, yes. And uh, you can go out mm -hmm. and get, uh, what about fish? Well, game fish, no, but things like minnows or some of the unprotected species, mm -hmm. yes. I put those in your aquarium. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about, uh, oh, <laughs> goodness. <laughs> what about uh, birds and mammals? Okay, birds and mammals are protected by law, and they may not be kept in captivity, killed, or, or even disturbed. All of them? Mm -hmm. Well, there are some that are accepted. For example, the yes. birds, the pigeon, the sparrow, the starling, mm -hmm. those pestiferous birds, and certain mammals that, that typically are very numerous and cause problems, like the red squirrel, for example. But basically, most birds and animals that sportsmen or wildlife people would like to have as pets are taboo from the wild. That's right. Mm -hmm. Do you have people come in and ask you, Rich, uh, can you get me a hawk, an owl? No, not so much with the with the uh, United States animals and game, but I have a lot of people that want ocelots and tigers mm -hmm. and lions and chimpanzees and monkey are two real big items well, that you can't get anymore. You for can't them. get a lot of those. But the way, if somebody wants a pet, a wild animal, some type of animal for a pet, they should go to a pet store, shouldn't they? Oh, most certainly. With a reputable, yes, with a reputable dealer, someone who has a. a and experience and, and reputation mm -hmm. in providing high quality, healthy animals. And I would say particularly those that breed their own animals. Oh, hold it, hold the phone here. <laughs> that really hurt. <laughs> I'm wow. holding by his nose, now, by his beak. Why oh. are you... Uh... Well, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Glenn, but this... <laughs> I imagine that a lot of people are surprised when they get pets and take them home and try to train even a parrot like this. Oh, absolutely. It takes a tremendous amount of time and training in order to get a bird to, to, first of all, trust you enough to allow you to do this kind and this, of thing. this bird is how old? 32. 32. Yeah. How much would it cost if somebody says, I got to have one of those, just got to? A couple hundred dollars? Oh, about 3,500 of them. 3,500 yeah. dollars. Well, that's what you're faced up against. What about parakeets? Well, that's a lot of different story, Fred. Those are, uh, we raise all of our own parakeets. We have any color that you can possibly imagine under the rainbow, anywhere from pure white, which are albinos with pink eyes, all the way into 
blues and purples and yellows and greens. Do they make as good? Can they do the things that a pair can do? With the same amount of training, I could, if I spent the same amount of time with a parakeet mm -hmm. that, that I've spent with this macaw, yes. Wouldn't you say, Glenn, that this is sort of the answer to people who want pets? Maybe I'd highly parakeet? recommend these birds if you're interested. One, not only for what Rich says, but two, these birds are adapted to captivity. And although you don't ever want to abuse or neglect a pet, these birds will tolerate a little bit of neglect, a little bit of abuse. And they, they adapt very well to ordinary methods. Uh, and as Rich says, he raises these, mm -hmm. whereas those macaws don't, don't uh, breed in captivity and their habitat in Brazil is being destroyed and their status right now is questionable. Like uh, whereas there's nothing like in question at all about these, these small parakeets. Okay, like, well that's sort of the answer if somebody wants birds for pets. Go to a pet store, get a parakeet, can, something like that. Don't take or birds Or a canary out of or a finch. There's a wide variety of choices. Big variety, Fred. How about for our anglers out there? Let's go to some fish. All of the fish I always see in pet stores are, are always, uh, I guess what you call tame fish. How come we never see any game fish? Doesn't anybody want any? Well, they're tropical fish that you find in a pet store, Fred. Sure, you can have uh, Michigan game fish, but you do have to have special permits from the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, you have to go out and you have to collect your own species. And it's a, it's a lot more work, and, and quite frankly, you bring diseases in from the lakes, and it's not quite as conducive as just buying tropical fish where the water is sterile and you, you, you don't really have the problems that you have with bringing in your own fish. Have you ever kept game fish? Yes, uh, there at the university we keep game fish on display and the students work with them and they have a great deal of trouble because of disease, just as Rich said, and also because these fish have a special diet. And it's very difficult to meet the dietary needs of, of these game fish in, in captivity. Oh yeah, feeding a pike, for example, daredevils really gets expensive. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but they, well, what is it cost to get a tank of just what you call the community fish and set it up? Well, community fish, Fred, like this one, um, you've got zebras and and uh, swordfish, some mollies, uh, goldfish. You know, you've got a basic, inexpensive setup. By the time you buy the tank, the gravel and the filter and that kind of stuff, usually under $25 if you don't go real extravagant. Well, that's a good alternative to a $3,500 parrot anyway. Let's go back and look at some of the, the mammals that you have. So I'm holding a guinea pig. You have a little hamster here, Rich. And uh, what do you have there, Glenn? This a, is a gerbil, and a it's gerbil? a black color phase of the gerbil. Well, aside from, from cats and dogs you can get at a pet store, it looks like everything else is rodents that's in the mammal department. Well, you can get skunks and ferrets and that kind of stuff, but they just don't tame down to make the kind of quality pets uh, mm -hmm. that we'd like to offer. Well, in conclusion, Glenn, our tour of the pet store here, what do you recommend to people who would really like to have some Michigan wildlife for a pet? Well, these Michigan wildlife that are produced in pet stores, because they're docile, they're handleable, they don't have a lot of special requirements, they're easy to take care of. You know, for a child especially, they can tolerate a little bit of neglect without suffering too badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something a child can enjoy and learn what animals need to survive, food, cover, water, and for these things can take a little bit of affection. So. Okay, well that's great. For uh, people who enjoy wildlife, go to your pet store. Don't take animals out of the wild. It's illegal and just not advisable. But these do make pretty good Christmas gifts, eh? Oh, sure, sure. A little hamster can give it a lot of kids a lot of enjoyment. And here's another and here's another wildlife pet that doesn't take much work, an ant farm, Fred. Super, Ed. And I'd like so that's about the most low maintenance. All you have to do is take them on a picnic once a year. Right. And uh, yeah. you're all set. No, but they send the ants to you with that. By the way, any of these Christmas gift ideas that uh, you see on Michigan Outdoors tonight, write to us, and we'll send you a list right away on where you can get these, what the price is. At. Our address is Michigan Outdoors, Box 1 East Lansing, 48823. Now, here's something that may not look too appetizing, does it, Ed? Well, that looks like wood chips to me. It is wood chips. Now, wood chips, what do you use them for in cooking fish and game? Put them in a smoker like this. Now, uh, Lure Jensen makes a Little Chief smoker. They bought out outers, so they're really the only ones that sells mm. a smoker like this. Electric, uh, plug it in, put the wood chips on a hot plate, put your fish or game on the rack, and believe me, it's very simple to learn how to smoke fish and game. Looks like you'd use that a few times, too. Ex an excellent Christmas gift idea for a sportsman who doesn't have one. Ah, how about a fish boil kettle? Can't beat it. Hey, you know, we used this on the show a while back, and we got a lot of requests for the recipe because it was a good recipe. And Potatoes, why? onions, mm -hmm. salmon in there, in the boiling water. Just stupendous. And you say that this probably tastes better than uh, other ways of cooking it? Yeah. Seems to, using a kettle like that, uh -huh. seems to taste better than just a, a colander in a Dutch oven. Uh -huh. uh, 
for recipes, we have some books here. How to Cook Michigan Salmon, put out by Joe and Sally Vollmer. An excellent book. A lot of really good recipes in here. We'll be drawing on these in the future mm -hmm. on the show. How about one of our favorites, uh, Get Hooked on Fish? You know, this is one we've uh, used uh, many times, right. the recipes out of here. Out of Lansing State Journal, did mm -hmm. a fish recipe contest. Here's one that uh, Steve Pelaski's wife, uh, Pelaski, uh, Jean, uh, wrote in Oscoda. He's a charter boat captain, so she gets a lot of chances to cook fish. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this one, uh, You Got One, Now What? Excellent. Another good book is the Michigan United Conservation Club's Wildlife Chef, and this has uh, oh, this has wild game animals uh, right. recipes in here too. Real good tips. Similar uh, in a way to Savor the Wild. Now this is really a gourmet cookbook that uh, Kay Ritchie's been on the show a number of times and will be on the show in the future. These are recipes from uh, outdoor writers around the country on game birds, marinade sauces. A real gourmet book. Savor the Wild. So write to us for those. Mm -hmm. Another thing in preparing fish. Rapella fillet knife, it's sort of a standard among amateurs, mm -hmm. but the pros use this one, a G96. Mm. Ed Stowe, the fish filleting champ, says if you have one of these and a glove like this, uh -huh. that's what you need to do the job. Let's go up to Ludington to our fish filleting competition we had in August and get a little taste of what that was like. Pete Rubianis was a strong contender. He's filleted a salmon in 21 seconds in front of our cameras before, but not during this contest. Although he ran a strong second, he says next year he'll beat the champ. And here's the champ, Ed Stowe from Ludington, who runs a fish market, so he's a real pro at filleting fish. And look at the tools he uses, two knives and a pair of pliers. He leaves the rib bones in the carcass, which saves him time, and put him over the top. This man does 100 tons of fish every year. Whitefish, lake trout, salmon. Look at the way he flipped that filet over there. Oh, oh no! 22 seconds! 22, congratulations, Ed! Well, he's the champ, and the knife he uses, look at this. That's, <laughs> that's a sharp, and that's a G96 Magnum filet. Mm. It's hard to get this knife any place in Michigan, but the Ed has a supply of these. Right. He arranged so people could have it. He says it holds an edge better than anything. You know, he says also, every fish filleter should wear a glove like this. This is called the wizard glove. The thing about it, you saw how I cut that paper? You go like oh boy, that. Now, I this is the stuff that. that bulletproof vests are made out of. A very important thing, a good idea for somebody in your family who likes to fillet fish, uh, write to us and we'll tell you how to get a hold of this glove. And why is it so important? Well, we met a guy at our deer hunting workshop this past October who uh, really should have had one of these and he's mm -hmm. going to get one, I hope, for Christmas. Let's watch. Safety in the outdoors, we can't stress it enough. You know, we do a lot of things on Michigan Outdoors here. We've had fish filleting contests and we like to talk about, you know, preparing deer and boning them out. But you, Bill Schneider, were here at our Deer Hunters Workshop where we talked about wearing that protective glove on your hand, and you came up to me and said what? I could have used one of those about two weeks ago because I cut my hand filleting fish. Oh, cut it filleting? I would have thought you broke your hand or something. Well, no. What, I, what happened? Well, we were in a hurry, and we got back in. We were late for dinner, and, of course, we are in trouble with the women, mm -hmm. and we got in a hurry, and... The bottom line is, my wet and slippery hand, I slid down the knife. I cut the tendons of the ring and little fingers and both the nerves and the little finger. Holy cow, and you have, you actually have some uh, fish line or something through those, through your nails. Yeah, they uh, stitched it right to the uh, a rubber band of the finger to kind of have tension, and that's attached to the cast down in here with a very scientific safety pin. Mm -hmm. And that just mm. keeps the tension on those. And then uh, as I'm getting more and more use, I gives it tension to flex up against that way. But the big thing is it holds it back in so you that, don't catch anything. That must have wrecked your whole afternoon's fishing. Ruined a heck of a good week of fishing, to be honest. A whole week? <laughs> well, what did you do when you cut yourself? That must have, have really been painful. It really wasn't very painful at all. It's uh, amazing how the body just shuts that right down. You're kind of in the shock, and you look down, and gee, you're bleeding all over everything. And... So just, you, you used a regular, what kind of filleting knife? A very sharp one? Yeah, I just sharpened the night before, and they were rappel knives, and they, I've had good luck with those. And so what exactly happened? How did your hand slide down? It? You, you I had a hold of it this way, and... With, with, with your... With your the uh, blade down. Mm -hmm. I, was, I usually do my knife work with this, and as I'm going over here, I really, I kind of bumped it on the table, and my hand slid down. My hands were all wet with the slime of the fish, mm. and it slid down the knife. Boy. What, what, could have, what could you have done to prevent that? 
Uh, not been in quite a big hurry to begin with. Not being in a big hurry, okay. That's what always gets you into trouble. And uh, frankly... What, what about one of those gloves? I could use one of those gloves, and my wife has informed me that I will have one of those gloves. <laughs> Very good. Well, that's the moral of the story. You, you can't be too safe, can you? It really scares you how fast the accident happens. You know, you, it's, it's just like that. It's done. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you spend a long time straightening it out afterwards. Hmm. Well... Bill Schneider, who's one guy we found who was filleting fish, made a mistake, a slip of the knife, and a, a painful accident. But you'll be back in shape when? Cast comes off in two weeks. Great. And you're going to be bow hunting? I hope so. <laughs> you know about those broadheads? Yeah, I, I know about those broadheads. Let me, let me tell you about broadheads. i got to go give Bill a lesson in sharp <laughs> broadheads. Now, when you sharpen them, I want you to be real careful. This is the glove that Bill Schneider should have used. He could have saved himself an awful lot of grief. A lot of people have gone to this since they've seen our fish filleting contest, and it, uh, it's a good deal, the wizard glove. So write to us here, and uh, we'll tell you how to get a hold of it, as well as this G96 filleting knife that Ed Stowe uses it, and he's the best. Now we're going to find out what to do if you don't prevent the accident and you find yourself in an unfortunate situation. The thing that I like to do is call a paramedic like Mike <laughs> Smith, RN for McLaren General Hospital. Mike, you've been so helpful on the show, giving deer hunters tips and, uh, you know, what to do in the woods and locating a hospital and that type of thing. But you have a first aid kit that mm -hmm. I really like. This is the pocket model. Okay, this is a simple pocket kit. You know, nice to carry with you while mm -hmm. you're hunting. Toss it in a tackle box. It's got the basic essentials to take care of most problems. This is something that uh, anybody could make up themselves? Anybody could make one of those up, and you can buy the equipment anywhere, any drugstore. Cost you maybe two dollars. Oh, well, that's a good idea for uh, some of you kids out there that might want to put something together for mom or dad, for just carrying in their pocket out in the field, gauze and so on. Write to us, by the way. We'll tell you what these components are and where to get them if you write to us here at Michigan Outdoors, Box One, East Lansing, 48823. And we will also tell you, besides this little pocket kit, which is a great stocking stuffer, what the components are in the first aid kit that Mike Smith recommends for camp. Mm -hmm. Right, Mike? You put this together. From your experience in the outdoors, you hunt, you fish, you didn't get a deer this year. Let's not talk about that. We won't that. talk about that. Let's get back to the <laughs> first aid kit. All of these things you say can be bought in a drugstore. Right. Everything's available locally. No problems getting it. It would cost you probably $15, $20, somewhere in that range to put one together. And this is an idea. Maybe your kids could get together and put one together for the family, make a great Christmas gift idea. But you say that your junior achievement company up there in Flint has done quite a job putting together some ready-made kits? They've done a beautiful job for us. Uh, they came up with two kits. Mm -hmm. We have first an emergency first aid kit. Mm -hmm. uh, contains all the necessary equipment that you need. Comes in a nice watertight package. How much does Junior Achievement charge for this? They charge eleven fifty for it. Oh, what a bargain. You can't beat it. Good group to support and a good... Uh, by the way, as we describe this, there's a phone number coming up on the screen, an 800 number that you can call at McLaren General Hospital. If you call it right away, they'll be able to get this in time for Christmas. Mm -hmm. You say your junior achievement kids can make as many of these? They'll make as, as many as we need. 1150. Here's one for you. This is uh, for uh, a good little basic sportsman's kit. Everything you need in it right there. That's 1150. And this is for your car. This is for the car. This is what a lot of people forget about when they go out to I don't they, think there's uh, enough stuff in here for my car, though. A lot of us think the same thing. A good but start. Oh, it's a flashlight. got the basic equipment that you need to get along if you do have a breakdown. Fix a flat. Okay, well, that, those are great ideas. They're great Christmas gift ideas. First aid for you, first aid for your car. Call that number right there, and you can get Mike Smith's department at McLaren General Hospital, and we'll get you these in time for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. That's something could maybe save somebody's life. <laughs> now we're going to try to improve their weekend with some tips for what to do in the outdoors. Plenty of elbow room, Ed. Great. Well, you know, they... Gonna need a way to get there, right? Hey, you gotta take a road. You gotta take some back county road that you don't know where it's and at. what's the best book? The Michigan County Map Book. It's published it. by the MUCC. Also has an outdoor guide in it. And this is the this is the best county map book there is, I think. Super Christmas mm -hmm. gift idea for any sportsman. Get an updated map mm -hmm. book. Of course, they have maps of the lakes themselves. Inland lakes, quadrangle maps, Great Lakes nautical charts. The MUCC has an index of all of the maps they have available at nominal prices right to us here. Michigan Outdoors. Box 1, East Lansing, 48823. We'll uh, let you know where to get a hold of all of the items you've seen on tonight's show, the Christmas gifts ideas. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're going to pick this up next week with some more. Let's all right. How about two more? 
again from the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, Michigan's 50 Best Fishing Lakes, and Trout Streams of Michigan. Both good books. Maps and descriptions mm -hmm. in there. Here's one, Hunting in Michigan, the early 80s. This is put out by the DNR. This is a great book because it has maps of all the state game areas. Every one of them in here, plus some tips on hunting in these various areas. It's a, it's a book that's really a great mm -hmm. thing that the DNR put out. And a new publication, the Michigan Angling Report, and this every month has a angling reports from around Michigan to tell you up to the minute details on what's going on. Great gift idea. Mm -hmm. Most of these from Michigan. We'll see you right here next week with more ideas on Michigan Outdoors.